Welcome to Let's Talk Wellness, where we will be sharing insights into the world of mental health and wellness as we explore traditional medicine and holistic healing options. It's time to have new conversations about mental health. Join Mara James, the founder and CEO of the Hugs for Life Healing Center, as she guides us along this journey. And now, let's talk wellness. Welcome to Let's Talk Wellness. I am your host, Mara James, and today I'm excited to introduce you to somebody that changed my life, an amazing woman, parent coach, and game changer, Deborah Ann Afarian. Hi, Mara. How are you doing? Hi, Thank you. Thanks so much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So I just want to get into the meat of it. You changed our family's lives. Um, Thank you for that feedback. Oh, and thank you for what you've done. So you have an amazing class that we'll talk about in a moment. And (laughs) my 22 year old son who was diagnosed with Asperger's and ADHD at the age of six was definitely a handful to say the least. We didn't have tools. We were never taught tools to uh, parent a neurotypical child. And then we were um, given this challenge. And I truly believe that you helped us um, realize that children can do well if they want to. And that for us, if my husband and I didn't change, I am convinced that my son would have become bipolar, building up that resentment between us. So why don't you tell us a little bit um, about the class, your organization and yourself? Okay, well, let me just tag off of what you were saying in that a lot of us do feel that kids do well if they want to. And the whole philosophy behind what I as an adult teach other adults is that kids do well if they can. If they could do well, they would do well. If they're not doing well, there is something getting in the way. And neurotypical or neurodiverse, it's up to us to figure out what that is. And kind of like what you said, Even with neurodiverse kids, we don't really go through this program to understand how to parent, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a neurotypical child and they present really well, they're compliant, it makes us adults look really good at this parenting job and we can pull it off with flying colors. You get a kid who gives a little pushback, is neurodiverse, doesn't really respond well to the expectations parents are asking them to do. And we all look really bad in the heat of that moment when we're trying to ask a kid to meet an expectation. That is when we have to think about kids do well if they can. If they could do well, they would do well. If they're not doing well, what is getting in the way and what do I need to do to help them meet the expectation. Conventional approaches say, make them want to do well. How do we make them want to do well? We dangle a carrot. We put out a consequence. We let them know that if they don't behave, they're not going to get the reward and they are going to get the consequence. Well, rewards and consequences were never meant to teach complex thinking skills, right? So if a kid doesn't have the ability to get compliant right away, we tend to think as adults, our job is to make them want to behave. And kids want nothing more than to please parents, even though it can look like they may not want to please us and they're just trying to push our buttons kids do want to do well. So because rewards and consequences were never meant to teach those complex thinking skills, we tend to fall into this place of Einstein's definition of insanity, right? We keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, and we expect a different result. And we don't know why we're not getting a different result, but that's all we've been taught. So that's where what I learned comes in and I didn't know it either till I you know, went and found out that there is another tool to use than rewards, consequences and ignoring the behavior that we don't wanna see, right? We say punish the 
behavior we like and make sure you ignore the behavior that you don't like. Well, that works for 70% of the population. And so the thought process was, well, if it works for 70% of the population, it's going to work for all of the population. You just need to be more consistent. You just need to follow through with that consequence, make sure you let them know that reward is there and that's going to work. And that's the big lie (laughs) because it doesn't work for all of the population. That 30% I kept looking for, well, what's going to work for those, you know, kids that fall in the 30% of the population that rewards consequences and ignoring doesn't work for. So it's a different tool. They need to learn the skills in order to behave well. So as parents, yeah, for neurotypical population, we didn't learn parenting exactly, but kids who comply well, who live up to our expectations the minute that we say it. Because if we tell a kid to do something and in 10 seconds they haven't done it, that's a long period of time, right? 10 seconds is a long time. We expect them to snap to it right away. And so we can pour gas on this fire uh, inadvertently because we don't have another tool to use. So neurotypical kids can make us look really good, but when you get, like you said, Mara, for yourself and your husband, a neurodiverse child that doesn't have those skills in place and rewards consequences and ignoring aren't gonna teach those skills, what do you do? Wow. Amazing. It's <laughs> so powerful. Um, that is, it's beautiful. Um, so how did you get into this line of work? You know, it sounds so simple, right? Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, oh, wow. That's great. Now I know what to do. And that's going to be easy to pick up that baton and go ahead with it. But knowledge doesn't necessarily mean you understand how to follow through with it. So how I learned it kind of goes back to my own childhood, being a kid that was neurodiverse. Um, Not that term wasn't around when I was young. I was the brat or the poorly parented kid, you know, that kid that wanted to um, challenge authority. Like I can remember statements like, oh, such a wild stallion, you know, we just need to polish her up and put that energy in a good direction. I can remember things like, oh, are you going to grow up to be a lawyer? You're so argumentative. Um, You always want your way. And I was very confused as a kid because I thought, doesn't everybody want their way? Like, I felt like other people are in pursuit of what they want. Why am I doing it differently? What is different about what I'm doing? And I never really felt like I got the memo on how to behave the way adults expect it, even though I kept trying, like now in reflection, looking back, I can feel those feelings where I was trying to behave, but I was in the front of the class, you know, standing, facing the class, walking that walk of shame, once again, you know, blurting out or not sitting still, uh, not acting like a lady, because um, I was constantly wanting to play and move around, just sitting didn't feel normal to me, typical to me. So when I grew up, I kind of just reinvented myself. I suppressed all of that childhood experiences, wanted to reinvent myself. And like everybody else, wanted to be the greatest parent. You know, you give birth to these kids and, oh, this is going to be so fun. And honestly, I felt like I'm going to relive my childhood through my kids because I'm going to parent in a way I wasn't parented. And everything is going to be skipped to my loo, my darling, and live happily ever after. Um, And 
I have two boys. They're 21 months apart. Uh, they are complete opposites. And the older son is a more challenging child for me to have parented. And it kind of felt like uh, a lot of us grew up with hearing when we misbehaved, we heard, I hope you grow up and have kids that act just like you're acting, right? <laughs> so it was like, oh my gosh, I have given birth to that kid. He was energetic. He was curious. He wanted to negotiate everything. Um, our younger son was very compliant, very easygoing, whatever, didn't matter. And the older child, by the age of three, I knew that there was something different about parenting him, right? And I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I was curious. By the time I got him into school is when I really realized I needed to figure out what was up, what was going on because I didn't want him to feel shamed and blamed like I felt in school for blurting out, for getting up out of his seat, for not wanting to do like crisscross applesauce, right? Mm -hmm. um, just, it seemed like the expectations that the class was having on him were simple enough and him not meeting them shouldn't have been as big of a deal as they were, but it was a huge big deal. Um, I was getting information from the teachers like Mrs. Aparian, he's smart enough to know better, he should know how to behave. And when I was hearing that, it started triggering memories of what I was going through. So I had my first kid at 36, had the second at 38, it was like going to be my third career. So how I found out about what I got into was because it was a career to me and I was going to find out what were the answers to what was going on for him. How could I explain to the teachers, you know, what was going on so that we could wrap a program around him that wasn't going to be traumatizing. I mean, today we all know about trauma, fortunately. Um, this was 20 five years ago. And it wasn't as prevalent that we talked about trauma necessarily, but we were starting to understand, although we didn't have the name for it, neurodiversity, like tongue in cheek, we would say, oh, different is the new normal and kind of sidekick it, but not really understand it. So I just started reading all kinds of parenting books, Mara, and I started learning about the brain. At that time, we were in the infancy of understanding the brain. Today, we're in the toddlerhood of understanding the brain, but we're still nowhere near where we're going to be or need to be to really understand how do we parent in a way that all kids can maximize their potential? And how do we parent in a way that isn't traumatizing, right? Because you think of that neurodiverse population, your son, my son, even though they had two loving parents, a great family, you know, were afforded all the things in life that could launch you into what we understand as success. And I don't mean that just in material ways, but in you know, good, healthy family, love and caring, even though we had all of that, just the way the world responds to how you may behave differently can be traumatizing. And that's what I found for our son, like it was traumatizing to be so singled out in the classroom to be that it's typically one out of five kids that will show different being the new normal or what we've come to know as neurodiversity. And teachers and adults, guilty as charged, even as a parent, I was spending, you know, so much time on my kid, micromanaging, trying to get him to do what would be what we think of as neurotypical behaviors. 
Um, and by that, like I said, in kindergarten, first, second grade, it was blurting out. It was um, wanting to follow the rules a little more rigid than maybe the other kid could let things go easier. It was black and white thinking. Um, and I didn't understand that at first, but I had to start researching it so that I could put a language to what was going on so that it wasn't looked at like I was making excuses for my child. I was giving an explanation. And then I also wanted to come in with solutions. So it wasn't until he was seven that I found Dr. Stuart Ablon and Dr. Ross Green that had a program back then called the Collaborative Institute. Um, that was at Mass General Hospital's Department of Psychiatry. It's now a small group called Think Kids with Dr. Stuart Ablon. And Dr. Ross Green now has Lives in the Balance. Uh, 19 years ago, they were together when our son was seven. Today, they're two separate nonprofits with the same message that kids do well if they can. Um, when I found that it resonated with me, I started to learn about skills like how do you tolerate frustration? How do you not be rigid? How do you have cognitive flexibility? How do you teach a kid to not be impulsive? Like the second they see something that they go after it, right? How do you work with the building blocks of executive function? And the biggest one that we all get very concerned about is that emotional dysregulation, right? We all know the two-year-old that throws a tantrum and it's cute and they're small and we get it, but when they're six or seven and that last Lego doesn't fit in this project that they've been working on for five hours and they get so emotionally dysregulated, we as adults get very alarmed and you get a dysregulated kid around a dysregulated adult and everybody loses IQ points and looks bad <laughs> in the heat of that moment. So when I found out the explanation behind this, and like I said, back then we were just in the infancy of understanding the brain. A lot of this was taken on faith. Like we're seeing it work. And we've got parents like myself who had one child who was meeting expectations and another child that had challenges meeting the expectations. And so a lot was blamed on poor parenting, right? We as parents took it on, like, what am I doing wrong? And if you get two kids that are neurotypical and meet expectations well and are super compliant, you feel like, wow, look, I'm a great parent. I have great parenting skills and not so much. I mean, it's a lot of the luck of the draw that you got a child who really has the skills in place to be able to meet the expectations and the expectations that they may not meet like dyslexia. You know, we think back 50 years ago, we thought kids with dyslexia were lazy and dumb and we dismissed them. When kids are quiet and compliant and struggling, we tend to have a lot more empathy than if they have those big emotions. It's the big emotions that tend to really frighten and concern adults. And, you know, we'll see a two-year-old have big emotions and we're empathetic and understanding, but we see a seven, eight year old have big emotions and people tend to judge a little bit like, oh, wow, can't they parent their kid? Like, what are they doing? If I was that kid's parent, I'd let them know they weren't going to get away with that behavior. And all kids want to behave and they're as afraid of those big emotions as the rest of us. So I went to learn more and more about it. Um, when I first read the books by Ross Green and Stuart Ablon treating explosive kids, it resonated with me. And as fate would have it, um, I am from Boston and their institute was in Boston. So I got on a plane and I flew back there <laughs> dropped the kids off with Nana and went to a conference 
to learn about this. That was 19 years ago. I sat in this conference room in Boston <clears throat> and I was so excited. Um, I heard the presenters, Dr. Ross Green and Dr. Stuart Ablon ask, who's a psychiatrist? Raise your hand. Who's a clinical psychologist? Raise your hand. Who's a therapist? And I was waiting for them to get to who's a parent. And they never did. So I kept quiet because I wanted to keep going back. And I considered myself then a conference crasher because I kept going back to these conferences where they were speaking a lot of lingo language, clinical type language that I really didn't understand at first, even to say like rigid is cognitive inflexibility, right? So it's like, oh, what is that? And looked all this stuff up and learned a lot about what the neuroscience was behind what was going on with our kid and came back with that information. Things started changing in our home, shared it with my husband. We teamed up together and he said, you know what, we have to not hide all about this. We have to get rid of the stigma by really talking about it and doing something about it. And then I felt like God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. I love so it. My husband said, I'll make the money and you go make the difference. So I just really felt because of my own childhood, my son, we need to break this cycle. And I felt, all right, I'm going to take on this calling and I'm going to go ahead and do that. So now, 19 years later, neuroscience has pretty well caught up. The 1990s was the decade of the brain. And a lot of what we took on faith prior to that has now been verified with all the brain mapping and all the uh, brain scans and just all the data that has to be collected to prove these things that um, aren't commonly accepted. So now we have it confirmed that, yeah, this does work. And the neuroscience shows that we want to parent in a different way and understand that philosophy that kids do well if they can. If they could do well, they would. But we tend to see it. Kids do well if they want to. And if they're not doing well, we're going to make them want to, right? And Mara, we all know you can lead them to the trough, but you can't make them drink. Amen. So I say we salt the hay to make them thirsty. Uh, so yeah. they want to drink. So they want to drink. That's beautiful. <laughs> and you know what, Deborah? And we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about something you shared with me that compliance is about skill, not will. So, friends, stay tuned. We'll be right back. In these shifting and changing times, more and more lives are being impacted by mental health. The Extraordinary Lives Foundation, also known as ELF, is transforming the way people view and navigate mental health challenges. Their mission is to improve children's mental health and wellness and support families by providing educational tools, resources, and awareness events. ELF encourages families to recognize symptoms, overcome the stigma, and reach out for help. Through prevention, early intervention, and holistic treatment, we believe many of the big problems facing today's youth can be transformed within a generation. Extraordinary Lives Foundation is excited to offer the Hugs for Life Healing Center, growing a worldwide network of approved holistic healers and bridging the gap between traditional and complementary healing options. Visit the Extraordinary Lives Foundation website at www.elfempowers.org to find out more about their resources and events. Together, we can change the conversation around mental health. We hope that you're enjoying today's Let's Talk Wellness podcast. And if you have a topic that you would like us to explore, we would love to hear from you. Simply email us at info at elfempowers.org. That's info at elfempowers.org. And now, back to the show. 
Welcome back to Let's Talk Wellness. I am your host, Mary James, and today we have Deborah Ann Farian, an amazing woman, parent, coach, and game changer. Hello, Mara. Welcome back. Wow, what a beautiful conversation. So much wisdom and insight. Thank you. Can you share, you said something to me when we first spoke about compliance is about skill, not will. I thought it was profound and I'd love you, for you to share with our friends watching and listening what that actually means. Right. <clears throat> so we tend to think that kids comply because they want to comply. And when they don't comply, they're not complying because they don't want to. And we have all these colorful terms that we use. They're being defiant. They're lazy. Um, they are seeking attention. What compliance is about skill, not will means is all kids have the will to want to do well. All kids want to please adults. They want to please their parents. They want to please friends. They want friendships. When the skill isn't in place to meet that. So let's talk about what kind of skills that might be, right? Let's, we talked a little bit earlier about cognitive flexibility as the technical term is called or rigidity. Um, a kid that may feel very rigid to certain rules. And even though they have the ability to be flexible with their rules, they're not able to be flexible with someone else's rules. So a lot of times we'll reason with that and think that if we walk in with our adult wisdom and experience and share with them that this is how you be flexible and don't be so rigid and stick on this one idea, right? <clears throat> and we think that that reasoning is going to resonate with the child to be able to, oh, thank you very much, adult. I appreciate you helping me to learn how to not be so rigid. Let's compare that to something like reading comprehension. <clears throat> A kid who is not able to comprehend what they read. We've come a long way with understanding academic challenges. It's not like we would go in and reason with that kid, now read slowly each word, think about what you read, and then come out and comprehend what you've read, right? <laughs> it, it's kind of funny when we think about it in this way and when we really take a look at what is it that we're doing with behaviors because we have not understood behaviors the same way. It's not as measurable uh, as academics might be with reading comprehension, decoding, math fluency. You know, like I mentioned earlier with dyslexia, we thought they were lazy and dumb, but now we know dyslexia is a real thing. So when we understand these skills in the behavioral arena, what we want to do is understand it in a way of reading comprehension, for an example. So if a kid can't comprehend reading, what do we do? We come in we do an assessment. We try to figure out, well, what is behind that? Is it dyslexia? Is it decoding? What is going on? Then after this long assessment to figure that out, we put some scaffolding in place and we have an expectation that it's going to take this kid three months, six months, a year, five years, what we know is it's going to take time for them to learn how to comprehend reading that doesn't come naturally to them as a skill. So that's about skill, not will, right? With reading comprehension. So it's the same way with behaviors. Like how do you teach somebody to come off of their original thought, that rigidity, be flexible to another thought? We want to look through a different lens of now I got to back that up a little bit, do an assessment to really figure out 
what is the underlying skill that is lagging here? And then how do I put that infrastructure in to be able to teach cognitive flexibility, to be able to teach them to get off their original thought, right? And that's a process. <laughs> we believe behaviors is more like, stop it, don't do that, do this, and the kid's going to comply and we're on easy street. Well, a kid who has the skills in place can meet that expectation. And what happens is when a child is exhibiting that they are willfully defying the expectation, us adults have three options, right? We can continue to pursue our adult expectation that they are going to comply, they're gonna comply, they're gonna comply until the kid then has a nuclear meltdown, right? And then we uh, don't see that it's two to tango here, that the adult has a role in that child falling off the ledge and having a nuclear meltdown. We believe it's a willful behavior. So then we either punish them for that behavior or we let them know they're not going to get the reward for that behavior, right? So if they don't meet the expectation, three options, the adult will, we just covered. By default, what we'll do too is go to the child's will. So we say, you know, eat your peas, eat your peas, eat your peas. They don't eat their peas. So then by default, we say, fine, don't eat your peas. Don't come to me when you're hungry either. That's it. We're done. It's over. By default, we go to the child's will without really understanding what's going on. And that's all those years ago, 19 years ago, what I learned with Dr. Stuart Ablon at Think Kids was collaborative problem solving. So now you have a new option, and that is plan B for collaboratively finding out, hey, what's up with the peas? What's going on? We can strategically go to the child's will to understand them better instead of by default, because we are not going to accomplish our goal if their skills aren't in place. It's not about will, it's about skill. So to that saying, compliance is about skill, not will. We want to get curious instead of furious <laughs> about what is up, what's going on. And in that example about eating the peas, maybe broccoli would suit them better, but we never really ask a kid what's up, what's going on. Wow. I love that. I forgot about plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, so now some, there are a lot of benefits that have come out of COVID and I'm hoping the answer is yes. Are you in your um, nonprofit giving, teaching your amazing class virtually? Oh, I'm teaching it back in person now. So during 2020, March of 2020, we were in the middle of our five week class. We were on week three when the shutdown occurred. So we okay. did go on to zoom and virtual um, then the silver lining of this pandemic is that think kids even went online so as i mentioned earlier i flew to boston to learn this training and it wasn't as readily available anywhere else other than boston and oregon and oregon it was a systems where you work there, went to school there. Um, they were within the state teaching collaborative problem solving on all levels in the schools, parenting programs, juvenile justice. Everything was rolling out this um, way of looking at behaviors. So the silver lining to the pandemic is everything went online. We all had to pivot really fast, right? And I know I had been getting requests. Oh, can you go online? Can you go online? But I did not put the bandwidth into that. 
until the pandemic hit. We went online from April until July. Then we went back in person. Then we had the shutdown again. So we went back online. Uh, as of January 2021, though, our room is big enough to have people six feet apart. I keep the class small anyways, six to 10 people. That way I can really um, work with each family on this journey of what is going on with their child, what we typically conventionally would do about it, why it didn't necessarily go so well for this population. And then weeks three through five, because it's a five week parenting class, are about collaborative problem solving, what we can do otherwise, and what we can do to help the brain stay regulated, help us stay regulated in order to teach the skills, right? Um, the silver lining, oh my gosh, the pandemic has really helped so many people understand what coping skills are all about because we really all became dysregulated in some way, shape or form. And for a lot of people, um, life gave them the expectations. They worked hard. They got what they wanted. It seemed really simple that why can't everybody just do that? So a lot has come out of 2020 that's been very advantageous, um, including the classes going online. So mine are in person in Tustin. We have a brick and mortar building there that I do teach the classes in person, um, that five week parenting class. I also have a two hour overview where I'll roll into any synagogue, church, um, learning centers, public school, private school, anybody who wants to just understand the tip of the iceberg of this way of looking at challenging behaviors. But now online, Think Kids has so much more offerings because they had to pivot very quickly. And the advanced training, the three-day trainings, eight-week class is all available online. So that's really good news. So is your five-week class similar to the Think, the Think Kids eight-week class? Because we do have followers all around the U.S., Yes, it is very much similar. So the eight week class is an hour and a half. My class is two hours. So that's why I consolidate it to the five weeks where they do the eight week, same curriculum, same content, um, different teachers. Wonderful, wonderful. So tell us a little bit about your nonprofit, please. Right. So my nonprofit is helping the behaviorally challenging child, otherwise known as HBCC, kind of came up with that name because I wanted to express exactly what it is that we do. And we help parents, teachers, adults, even clinicians understand behaviorally challenging kids, right? If I was to say, in a nutshell, what I do is I help adults learn how to really listen to what kids are saying. We try as adults to solve the problems with kids, the unsolved problems, like we observe what's going on. We think we know what is the problem. We let them know what they should do to fix it. And usually we're throwing a lot of darts and not hitting the bullseye. And the concept of empathetically talking to kids and finding out what's up and what's going on, first of all, helps us to solve what the problem really is because usually we're going in with the assumption of the problem and we're trying to solve the wrong problem, right? So this nonprofit started organically because I was working with our son in our school and the teachers had a lot of faith in understanding that he did want to behave well. It happened to have been a 
private school that they felt they ministered to all kids. So they really wanted to meet the needs of all kids. And they really put that extra effort into what can we do, Mrs. Zafarian, like you're flying to Boston, learning all this, help us back here. And so we did incorporate it into the school and won the Trailblazer Award um, by reducing suspension, detention, and being put out of class with the kids by 70%. And other parents were saying, hey, can you teach me this? So I'm like, yeah, let's start a parenting class. Let's start, well, actually it started with a parent support group. So we would all get together and start it. Mara, I thought like one or two parents would show up, right? I'm getting like 20 and 30 parents showing up. And I'm thinking, wow, our community is a lot bigger than I thought. It was a little vindicating, like, yay, I've got my, my community. That felt really great. The parenting support group evolved into the parenting class. And like I said in the beginning, I was a conference crasher and this wasn't really rolled out as much for parents or teachers. It was more rolled out for clinicians and organically now it has grown to where this is also very robust for parents and teachers. So my little nonprofit, yeah, started 12 years ago. Um, I felt call to share the good news with other parents. It's very energizing and invigorating for me to share this message. Being that kid myself and having a child that was much better understood earlier on. And to your point in your introduction, when you talk that if we are circling with the right treatment, we can avoid so many bumps in the road, like you were saying, even the you know, brain pathways being traumatized into a bipolar state, right? Or being um, traumatized into oppositional defiant disorder, which to me, to this day, what I feel, if anybody says, oh, that kid is so oppositional, we're just using the wrong tool and we're not treating this child appropriately. And we can avoid so many bumps in the road if we have like really truly trauma-informed early treatment. And it helps us as parents because we're uncomfortable when we're micromanaging and feeling triggered by our kids. Let's face it, none of us like to yell at our kids, but typically we find ourselves yelling at our kids and imagine a world and a program where we truly can break the cycle of that kind of dysregulation as adults that brings us to yelling and feeling frustrated by our children. We can see them all as two-year-old toddlers that isn't that so cute and I'm gonna keep my wits about me the biggest thing I think that comes from the nonprofit, the message, as I said, um, listening to helping adults learn how to listen to kids. But it's also that if we come in as parents and have all these rules without relationship, it leads kids to rebellion. Absolutely. And we can definitely avoid all of that. Wow. And what is the best way for people to get in touch with you, Deborah Ann? Well, my website is hbcc.us. Okay. There were no more orgs or dot coms left. So hbcc.us. Okay. Uh, you can email me at info at hbcc.us. So mm -hmm. helping the behaviorally challenging child. And they can call me 714. 695-1057. I've maintained that landline to be a lifeline for anybody that wants to call. Beautiful. And what about social media? Yes, I do have a closed Facebook page, Helping Challenging Children. I'll also have on LinkedIn, Helping the Behaviorally Challenging Child, Instagram, 
Um, what other one? There's lots of social media out there, right? Instagram, LinkedIn, the website, and the closed Facebook page. Oh, and the public Facebook page, helping the behaviorally challenging child. Beautiful. We'll have all those listed. And I'd like to once again say thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you've done for me personally, for my family, for all of your clients, you and all of our listeners. You are amazing. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Let's Talk Wellness. This podcast has been brought to you by the Hugs for Life Healing Center, a division of the Extraordinary Lives Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. If you would like to listen to more conversations like this, we invite you to subscribe to our mailing list at www.elfempowers.org to be notified when our weekly episodes are published. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to bringing you our next conversation on Let's Talk Wellness.